Neil, you're not Lee. I'm not. How you doing, Gwilym? I'm very good, thank you, Lee. Yeah, Lee can't make it. Uh, family stuff, but it's good to have you here. How are you? I'm not bad. I've had a busy start to the year. I don't know if you're aware, but um, new President Matt Dixon and I were in Parliament last week. Um, oh, meeting excellent. meeting the I shadow think, IP I, minister. I didn't actually know. I feel like I should know that. How did that go? Could you find them? I always worry about shadow ministers because <laughs> they live in the dark. No, it was it, shadow IP minister Matt Rodder um, speaking at a reception held by the Alliance for IP. So we took the opportunity to speak with him and other Labour parliamentarians that were there to explain how we can help any future La- Labour government with their innovation strategy. How far up their agenda is... IP. Is this one of these people with 27 things on their roster or is it just IP? Where are we? Well, he is the shadow IP minister. So we hope that they will have a focus on IP. Um, I'm, we're, we're hoping actually to pull a meeting together of all Labour parliamentarians interested in IP. So that's on the agenda for us over the next few weeks. And how are you, Neil? You, as in you, Neil, how are you? I'm all right. I'm OK. I mean, I need to get fitter, but... Um, is your knee still playing up? It is a little bit. It is a bit. But how about you? Have you kept or broken any New Year's resolutions? Are you a New Year's resolutions kind of guy? My New Year's resolution to calm down a bit hasn't gone very well. So it's a bit it? wild at the moment. Yeah, as we were just discussing, trying to get in during a rail strike. <laughs> depressing when you cycle everywhere. Actually, just on your fitness, I used to know an old chap who had a war wound and one of his legs didn't bend, so he just sawed one pedal off his bike and he pedal everywhere one legged <laughs> um so if you're looking for fitness tips get a massive bulky quad that's the way to do it lee davis and Gwilym roberts are the two ips in a pod and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property brought to you by the chartered institute of patent attorneys shall we start the actual podcast we should, shouldn't we? We should, shouldn't we? So we're doing MIP, Managing Intellectual Property, today, and uh, it's great to see my old friend, Max Walters. Max, how are you doing? Fine, Gwilym. Fine. Good to be here. Thanks for getting the um, thanks for getting the name right. I got an email just before I came on this podcast um, asking someone to provide a comment to Max Walters at IAM. So um, I'm <laughs> glad you got it. Am I managing IP right? Anyway. <laughs> oh, well, don't forget the competition in so early as well. But MIP, we're here to chat about... Um, Publications have been going for quite a long time now. Yeah, I think I think we're right. I'm right in saying we're the oldest uh, IP publication. I think sort of the 1980s. It was um, it was set up by um, as you probably know, Jeremy um, Jeremy Phillips, who went on to do a number of things, including IPCAT or IPCAT. What do we call it for a number of years? Still don't and, know, uh, but yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was remarkable. I think it's it obviously kicked off in the UK, um, but it's pretty pretty international now. Yeah, so we've got um, reporters based in America, or one reporter based in America, um, a girl in India, and um, we have an office in Hong Kong. We don't currently have a reporter based out there, but we do cover. We cover. We've got the whole globe covered on, on our um, on our reporting team, which is uh, yeah, we try to anyway. And a fantastic awards events as well. I've, I've been to a few. Yeah, that's coming up in in April. I'm sure you'll get the uh, get the memo about that soon enough. But that's uh, that's a big. A big deal for us and i'll be um well i've got the i would say the pleasure but it's a little little bit nervous but i'll be hosting this year alongside hopefully a, a guest so um yeah that'll be uh that'll be a big one for us does that mean that you have to do that bit where you do the best non-contentious trademark practice from azerbaijan is that, is that part of your exactly point? about about 450 awards to uh to <laughs> run through and to, <laughs> yeah um but it'll be um it's a good it's a good thing for us everyone has a good time and uh I'll, uh, I'm sure I'll get some stick from the uh, from this from the guest host as well, which will be fun. No clues about who the guest host is then. I don't know how much I can say to be honest, but it, it's possible that it might be the same person who did it last year, which I'm sure will be easily easily findable online, uh, or okay. or somebody else potentially. But um, if, if I'm not allowed to say this, I have to ask you to cut this bit out of the podcast. But um, yeah, we are we are trying to get <laughs> yeah. a uh, we're trying to get a good. Um, celebrity host to uh to help us out with it this year which would be nice i haven't been to those awards for i don't know six or seven years be good to go again yeah no it's well, uh it's a good it's a good event good food everyone's in a good mood so it's uh yeah 
it's a good right. good evening. S- sounds like Neil's free if you need an IP celebrity. I'm up for it. Yeah, there you go. Co-host sorted. <laughs> Gotta bring your jokes with you and uh yeah. <laughs> so do you want to give us a little bit of background about how you got into MIP or into journalism generally always interesting to hear about different tracks of life? Yeah, so after university, I did what's called the uh, NCTJ, which is a kind of postgrad qualification in journalism where they teach you how sort of not to be in contempt of court and that sort of stuff and shorthand a few other sort of um, skills. Um, and then after that, I joined a local paper immediately, um, which was, you know, great fun. But um, it got to the point where the resources were kind of being stripped to the bone. So I, I made the jump into, into B2B journalism. Had a had a couple of jobs, including on another unnamed IP publication for a while, uh, and then went to the uh, Law Society Gazette, which I was just talking about with Neil before we started, and now uh, I find myself at managing IP. So, uh, yeah. Well, we had a similar a career trajectory at the start. I, I also did an NCTJ course. How oh, did you? Okay, where did you do yours? Sheffield. Sheffield. Oh, lovely. Oh, yeah. good. I hope you went to oh, lots yeah. of Wednesday games. <laughs> I, uh, didn't, I did actually. Harlow College. You did. Ah, you okay. I did part mine at Harlow. Yeah. 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 Harlow had a, a very good reputation at one point. I don't know what it's like now, but it had, well, I don't know if this is good or not, actually, but um, Piers Morgan is amongst the alumni at Harlow, uh, NCTJ. So, uh, but Sheffield is, uh, mm. yeah, a big fan of Sheffield. So, you know, yes, yeah, actually, just quickly, you know, as you're here, how did you get, how did you end up here? Where have you been since your journalism course? Um, I was in journalism for about, 16, 17 years, and then I went into PR and then public affairs and then public sector sort of PR. And then, um, yeah, got headhunted by SEPA while I was working for the probation service doing national PR and comms for them. So slightly different route into IP, <laughs> Max, for me, but yeah, here we both okay. are. How did, you, how did you find the kind of getting to grips with that I suppose when you first joined I mean I guess that's the kind of thing that lots of lawyers are interested in with people who from a from a non-law background getting into IP they always wonder how you find it kind of yeah it's a steep learning it curve isn't it steep yeah, learning curve absolutely. <laughs> still learning now I think a lot of the time but which is why we get managing IP uh, a great publication which gives you education about uh, intellectual property on a regular basis. Um, well, there you go. <laughs> Job Excellent done. Plot. What a segue. Uh, yeah. No trouble at all. Um, so, I'm interested, what sort of um, sexes do you tend to focus on with the you know, as your audience? Who are, you, who are you aimed at? So, I suppose, like, primarily we'd say law firms um, globally. Um, we're kind of actually going in a kind of slight change of direction in terms of our editorial focus recently we're kind of pivoting more towards what we've well what has been dubbed the uh, business of law quote unquote so that would be sort of essentially anything that's of interest to law firms in terms of what their rivals are doing how they're managing their practice um how to win new business win new clients so one thing we try and like to do quite regularly is speak to in-house counsel sort of find out what their top concerns are and how private practice lawyers, private practice IP lawyers can help them. Um, so it's really sort of about, I don't like the term business of law particularly, but it's a kind of, it's a bit of a catch-all term, but it's kind of helping IP lawyers um, know how they need to react to market developments to win new business, essentially. It'd be a sort of my very succinct summary. That's very clear as well. I've not come across the term business of law, but it, as a private yeah. practitioner, it rings a bell immediately yeah. and I can, I can see exactly what you're what you guys write about so you've got in-house what's um any uh, good any big name in-house uh commentators you've had on your on your books yeah so um we got quite friendly with some guys at um lvmh the big fashion house um we've got buyer on there novartis sort of the big pharma companies quite often um speak to us we've got a um an editorial board of um sort of esteemed lawyers who um sort of help us out with agree to help us out quite regularly with coverage and there's a few um in-house lawyers on there uh, my favorite one is the um the company that owns the rights to pepper pig given that i've got a uh, a four-year-old uh, four-year-old boy and a two-year-old girl who are very uh, <laughs> very keen when i'm speaking to the pepper pig lawyer which they quite like <laughs> that is quite exciting actually yeah, yeah there's something i'm um, currently my daughter I think just we'd, I'd have to work for a zoo to impress her at the moment. That's my only my only hope. That would impress me, to be fair. Yeah, by the way, just completely irrelevant. Keeper in another life. 
<laughs> well, I went to London Zoo. This is completely off topic, but it amazed me. This, you went to London Zoo the other day, and the outside have got the bizarrely the terms and conditions under the licensing from the government. And there's about I don't know if you've ever read it. It's a very strange question. I'm sure you probably haven't read it. One of the clauses yeah. is their duties in case of an escaped animal, which is that they have to report any animal escape within 24 hours. 24 hours. Wow. They've got lions there. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really, and doesn't he say working days? I've no idea what, what happens if a lion escapes on a Friday evening, but. I feel, I feel like someone would know within 24 hours if a lion or an elephant escaped London Zoo. I don't think it would take, don't think it would take too long before people probably worked out what happens. It's, it's the strangest. I, 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 I could run the zoo on those terms. It's very, it sounds very relaxed exactly. to me. Yeah. Should we, should we tell them about the escape lion? It's like, well, you know, <laughs> EastEnders is on now. We've got 24 hours, so. <laughs> Busy day at work. Oh, I meant to mention the lion to the boss. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that that was a, a side story, but interested me. Um, yeah. So what's 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 hot at the moment? What topics have you found yourself focusing on? Yeah. So we've got um, quite a big. Our top story at the moment on the website is um, all about the EPO. Um, a former director there has kind of called into question the. Um, I suppose this is an ongoing issue that you'll probably be aware of, but the the kind of quality of the patents that it grants. So it's very big on like numbers of patents that are grants per year, but it has come into question whether they're granting the best quality of patents. So this uh, guy is a former director. He's pulled together some statistics, which um, you can read about, but it's apparently only 20% of patents survive untouched at the end of boards of appeal proceedings. So I'll leave you to be the judge of whether that's uh, so over 80% of patents effectively do get changed once they go to the boards of appeal. So I guess his argument is that that suggests that some of these patents probably shouldn't have been granted in the first place, and they should have been slightly carefully, more more carefully considered or amended before they went to the boards of appeal, etc. So uh, that's the kind of on, ongoing thing that our reporter Rory, who I mentioned earlier, has got a new job, sadly, but he's been he's been following quite closely. Um, and on the subject of patents, we're also following the um, EU's SEP plan, which I'm sure you sort of know all about or have been following quite closely. I mean, I'm sure most of your readers don't need to be told what's what's going on there, but we're kind of well, trying to get our head around that, really. Where have we got to? I, I know it's ongoing. Have we actually got a decision yet? Are we waiting on that? I'm not going to yeah, so the jury committee, which I think is the legal affairs committee, they've backed the plans in principle. Um, there's 13 votes in favour, 10 abstentions, no votes against. So could say it's not a ringing endorsement but um it's it's proceeding on to the next stage but there's i to be honest with you I, i'm not a massive expert on how eu laws work but there's there's multiple stages and sort of trilogues and sure. quad logs and quin logs that they have to go through to to get something over the line but for the most for the time being it's it's going ahead which is interesting what that vote says is that more people care than don't <laughs> but that's yeah. that all okay interesting sorry neil no, I just say I was reading that story earlier and um, see the patent owner group is um, not happy trying to um, no. hold up the, so SCP, uh, the process. Exactly. So generally, SCP owners are not in favour of this because, um, well, I think there's there's a couple of aspects, but um, one, they're going to have to kind of reveal the terms of their licensing in this sort of EU IPO run database. Um, but also, I guess there's a, there's a concern that the EU IPO at the moment doesn't have any experience with dealing with patents at all. It's um, you know trademark and design focused agency, um, so it's it's sort of an unknown, I suppose. Handing handing the power to the EU IPO to to do this, um, and I think SEP owners generally think that the current system works quite well. Um, you know, there's there's lots of licensing deals done. Occasionally, it does have to go to litigation, very expensive litigation, which is why I guess implementers, as we call them, the people who use those SCPs um, want some sort of system whereby this can be this could be effectively regulated but um it's going to be a it's going to be a messy one for sure I don't know what the I don't know what the right answer is but um there, neither side is particularly uh yeah happy at the moment there are layers on layers on layers of complexity with this as well it's yeah you know, 30 years in patents and I have to get my head wrap my head around it and sit down for a while because You've got the whole essentiality thing, and you've got yeah. counterclaims and counter counterclaims. It's mad. That worries me more. Yeah, the complexity of it being handled by a new group could push things back a few years. I've heard one suggestion. It's more of a kind of an attract. It looks good politically, possibly rather than necessarily being the best thing for the for the, for the commercial world. But there we go. We'll see. 
There you go. Well, yeah. it wouldn't be a, a massive surprise for the EU or any sort of, you know, government agency to do something that looks good politically, but doesn't yeah. make much sense practically, would it? But true, yeah. true. Yeah, well, you're a journalist. You, you see this more than we do. But no, I, yeah, that's sorry, I pick out. But more broadly, actually, just on that topic, um, there seems to be a continuing battle between the EU and, in particular, the EPO about kind of who runs IP in in Europe and the EPO has obviously got yeah. this kind of huge inertia of thousands of highly trained examiners and we'll come back to that quality thing in a minute from me but the the, the, the the tensions between the EU and the EPO is that something you're keeping an eye on? Yeah definitely I mean I don't know how strong the tensions are really because the the leader of the EU IPO now which is Joan Grau and the leader of the or the president of the EPO which is Antonio Campinos are our old friends they used to work together so I'm sure there's yeah. there's no sort of serious kind of like nasty rivalry going on there but i guess you're right definitely this sort of tussle for for who should be responsible for what um my gut instinct when i heard that this eu was going to do this um regulation or proposed regulation was that the epo would be best place to to do it because they they deal with patents but as you said they have this kind of weird status where they're not an eu body and they're not really uh they're this sort of supranational agency so they're not it's not you know, they shouldn't be getting involved in things to do with the EU. So, um, and they did obviously come out and say that they think they're a better place to to deal with this. So I guess it's just one to one to keep following. But in terms of their kind of their rivalry, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's uh, <laughs> it's it's an interesting one. But definitely the the head honchos of both agencies are are fairly friendly with each other. I understand. That's good news. And, and Neil, um, we obviously keep an eye on this what's what what how would you summarize what seek was trying to do to kind of be involved in this debate well it's our ip commercialization committee that looks at standard essential patents it hasn't been a subject that's had much discussion and debate recently but i'm sure this eu ipo development will be discussed at the next committee meeting but to be honest with you i can't give you a, a, a clear straight answer i'm afraid no that's fine i think um I, we you know, post Brexit, it's always tricky for us to keep an eye on all these developments as we yeah, go on. Sure, yeah. um, we're just that bit further out, and we've been, you know, as CEPA's trying to maintain a kind of commentator position, and we have a great yeah. relationship with EPO, who listens brilliantly. EU and EIPO, yeah. you know, we're still rebuilding that, sadly, after after what happened. Um, but it's, it's a high priority. I think it's really important. Mm. And, and I think we yeah. another thing I should mention is we interviewed um, Matt Dixon, your um, your current president or your president for 2024 in um at the start of the year i think it was um a few weeks ago he mentioned which i thought was quite interesting was that you want to kind of really promote um uk attorneys at the upc still um his his phrase was was hired guns at the upc which i quite liked the uh i quite like the turn of phrase there so obviously upc is still a big focus for you guys yeah oh, yeah is. i mean I mean, looking at law as a business, so business of law, sorry, um, we find ourselves in a position where I think UK attorneys continue to be kind of glo globally sought after. And this is not just me saying that. We do find that a lot um, as centres of excellence. And of course, we've got that. Um, we do have the qualification through being European representatives. Um, at the moment, having said all that, it's very much dominated by Germany, of course. And I think and the German attorneys have got a yeah. lot of it. Um, yeah, Neil, we're busy I guess on that. It's as well, not surprised, though, is it, that Germany would be sort of taking the charge on on UPC work? Yeah, all I would add is that we are talking to our international partners about you know the skills and expertise of not just UK patent attorneys, but U UK IP litigators as a whole. Um, and we're we're hoping to um, to promote UK IP litigation internationally this year. That's certainly one of Matt's priorities. And yeah. um, we've got a number of um, international presidents of patent institutes coming to his presidential drinks reception next week. So we'll be talking to them about that. Japan, uh, Korea, America, um, presidents from all over coming to that. So, yes, we cool. shall be talking UPC to them for sure. Are you, are you, are you coming to that, Max? Are you coming to this? Uh, I don't know, but I, it sounds interesting. I'm definitely, I'm no, definitely we, one of us. We've got to get Max along. We'll, 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 we'll try and sort that yeah. out. You'll know them yeah, all anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> oh, hopefully. I don't there's still there's still people I meet every every so often I go out and about. There's people I haven't met yet, or people I didn't know of who are apparently very very well known. And then it's um, it's it's not because they're not well known. It's just that I obviously don't know as many people as I think I thought I did. <laughs> it's it's a surprisingly disparate world. There's tens, there's thousands and thousands of attorneys just in the UK. It turns out. Yeah. 
And across Europe, obviously, loads more. Yeah. And a huge judiciary. You know, I, yeah, I, one keeps coming across new names. But that's good. You need that. Lots of people care. Um, if I could, I'm just going to go back to that quality point you you started mm -hmm. with there, yeah. the EPO. Because, Neil, I mean, we again, we obviously get a lot of feedback from our attorney um, community about things like the EPO. And I'm on Pat, yeah. Patents Committee, PatCom. That's a very clear source for it. We don't get that much in the way of concern, as far as I know. Have you, have you heard much more than that? Neil? No, no. I mean, you know, I think the staff groups guided by um, PATCOM's experience and practice at the coalface, and I certainly haven't uh, heard any different to you. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah, the, the guys who are mainly behind this is a group called the, um, who we've, we've you know, quoted them before, and you may have heard them, they're called the Industry Patent Quality Charter. So it's basically yeah. a group of in-house counsel. I think there's a few private practice lawyers on there anyway, but they're sort of, they just want to, I don't think it's anything like, you know, they're not like you want to shut down the office or anything. It's just a sort of um, an ongoing thing where they sort of want to make sure that the quality of patents main, granted is always not very strong so that, you know, you don't have to potentially um, get amended endlessly at appeals or get revoked after appeals or so that everything that's been granted is essentially a focus on quality over quantity, basically, which yeah, is, I, I suppose I, is a fair enough concern to have. Um, and I, yeah, now you mentioned that group, we are aware of that story. That rings, that obviously rings bells with me. And we have discussed that within SEPA. Willem, you, you might remember the discussions about that. And I, I think, do, I do. I think the, um, the overall decision was that, you know, we felt that quality wasn't a significant issue, significant mm. enough to, to raise. That's interesting. I'm sure lots of people have different different views on it. Um, I mean, the EPO, they do a lot of very good stuff. And they're always very kind of um, strong in their in their response to um, in their response to um, to everything that we put to them. So um, they've got lots of they've got lots of committees and things looking at it. I mean, yeah. the stats in the UK are much better. I don't think our courts are particularly. No. Um, you know, they, they do tend to have a look at patents and rethink them. It actually opens up a really interesting broader debate, which has got quite a few facets at the moment about where the quality of patents should sit. And basically, it comes down to how much is it reasonable to expect a patent applicant to pay to get a patent um, versus the potential benefit. And there's a school of thought, one school of thought says they should all be litigation ready and magnificent and we can push the stats up that way. Um, another school of thought says that what one percent less than one percent of patents get litigated. So the ones that do are going to get severely tested, and they are going to have new challenges that the EPO wouldn't have resources to do. On the other hand, it's granting a lot of patents that you know are I, I know I do that they're rigorously tested. I think there's a there's a kind of a price point sitting behind that discussion uh, about you know how much do you expect the EPO to charge, for example, um, and it's either through pre grant fees or through you know it kind of hits you through annual fees, and one way or another you've got to pay for the system. Um, and also, it's early time. Um, you want the difficult cases, you have to fight harder for them. It's always going to push the costs up. So I think there's a broader debate still not quite being had there about where the actual point should sit. Um, a definition of quality I heard. Yeah, well, I, I heard a really good definition of quality once, is it, it's what the client wants. Well, there you go. Yeah. I mean, you can only do what you're asked to. You can only do what you're asked to do, can't you? So, And so on the um, on the legal front, so that's some sort of kind of interesting kind of gross things. Do you tend to be keeping a track of, you know, in large board of appeal decisions and UK case stories that are... Uh, a little bit, yeah. Definitely, the major enlarged boards of appeal decisions we would we would do. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the major ones we've done in the last sort of a couple of years, whatever. It was a G G119 was um, one of the sort of big ones we did. I think um, there's been a couple on when immediately post COVID we did a couple of those ones that centred on Vico hearings and the legality yeah. of yeah enforced um, video conference. I should say so. Um, yeah, it's definitely something we keep an eye on. I think. The issue we have at the moment is those kind of things are quite heavily sort of practice of law focused, as I would say. So they're kind of about case law, et cetera, which we're sort of gradually moving away from. So it may be the sort of thing that we would get sort of externally, external contributors to write about. Sure. You know, we get a lot of submissions from law firms saying, can I write about this um, this article, this interesting this interesting judgment or this interesting decision? Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely something we uh, we keep an eye on. Yeah, And the Vico one was very much... At the yeah. crossover as well because it had a lot to do no, with absolutely how, yeah, yeah yeah i can see that so yeah it's interesting actually i think because there are many other channels for the legal analysis angle not not least of course our love, beloved super journal neil absolutely pick up the super, super journal. journal you've got behind you me no 
No, no, uh, Neil. That, no, 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 that's not no. Secret Journal. That I'm, looks I'm like working something. from home today, no. so oh, okay. I don't know what my partner would say if I started framing Secret Journals and putting them on, on the wall in my lounge. <laughs> <laughs> she might have something to say about that, Max. I thought um, I didn't. I couldn't see the what it no, was. I could I just don't. see lots of what looked like magazine covers. You've got. I'm guessing you've got your family behind you, Max. By the way, I do. Yeah, they're quite old. Quite old photos now. Some of them, but um, yeah, I don't know how much you can. I don't know how much you can see. Yeah, we get given photos every so often from the nursery, and they. Uh, yeah, these are actually my favourite films. Good off a little bit. Are they okay? Yeah. What have you got there? Can I can I recognise any of them? I can't. Um, oh, top left. That's. Is that the usual suspects? The usual suspects, oh, yeah. yeah. The yeah, Shining. That's right. A few others. That's interesting. Ooh. Good conversation. Shining. Piece, Where's the Shining? Oh, the typewriter. The shining on the... Oh yeah. yeah. Good. This is quite visual for a podcast. It is really not great for a podcast, is it? Justice listeners, great <laughs> pictures behind Neil. Um, um, just in terms of kind of where you're going in terms of your um your channels, as it were, Max. Um, obviously you've got the, the print copy, but these days I guess there's a whole yeah. bunch of different angles that you go through. Yeah, so we don't do print anymore. We did do a PDF for a while that was sent out yeah. quarterly to people, and we stopped doing that towards the end of last year. Um, mm-hmm. So now we're very, very much just basically digital focused. Um, but we do have a, a newsletter, which I don't know if you guys uh, get. If you don't, then you probably should be. But um, that's uh, especially the Thursdays one, which are, is our patent strategy newsletter. Um, so we have four newsletters per week that get mailed out to our clients and that's just a mix of news and analysis from from the past few days essentially um but the website is our our main kind of channel now and the other thing we're doing recently is we're linking up our we're sort of drawing together i suppose our news website managing ip with um ip stars which is our sort of database of, of firms and practitioners and we're kind of bringing them together to offer a sort of more of a one-stop shop for everything because i think previously they'd been a bit they're on different websites and people didn't quite know whether they were connected um so we're trying to sort of draw those two together as well i'm just interested to know whether max was looking to cover the the big ip finance story that came out a couple of weeks ago the ip back loans just launched by nat west i don't know if you saw oh, that. yeah yes we did we did do that we did do something on that we included a kind of um summary of that in our um we do a sort of weekly roundup of ip news that you uh-huh. that you might have missed but we do have that down as something to something to look at because again going back to this business of law uh phrase so that's quite a sort of business of law type story yeah, yeah it's sort of third party financing and, and loans from banks about ip that's definitely sort of something that we, we are keen to look into yeah yeah banks saying it's a world first to offer loans mm-hmm. for as little as two hundred and fifty thousand across the entire bank and using ip as collateral it's a collateral yeah yeah, yeah. so singapore's been doing something like that for, for a while mm-hmm. now i think but... yeah I was just going to mention Turkey as well. I remember doing an interview with the Turkish IP office and they were doing IP as collateral as a kind of initiative a couple of years ago. Um, so it's something that's definitely been done, but um, definitely interesting to see it being done. Yeah, I well. think Nat West are saying it's it's the fact that they're introducing this to the mass market and offering the loans for that low that they think is new. I don't know, maybe it's not. No, no it's interesting when we saw that for mm. sure. So as a private practitioner talking to someone who's keeping an eye on what you should worry about for the business of law, what should I be worrying about? What, where, where, are the, where are the changes coming to the profession that we need to keep an eye out on? I suppose it's 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 anything to do with like if firms are kind of creating new practice areas to sort of deal with the new new emerging areas of IP, like we hear a lot about AI, you know, whether we're going to get sort of specialised AI departments that are going to kind of draw on IP, but other aspects of, um, of the law, sort of like, you know, data protection lawyers and this, that, and the other, and, and the, the potential impact that could have on IP practices as a whole. Obviously, more widely, AI, you quite often look at how AI is going to affect jobs, legal jobs, particularly sort of the uh, searching kind of jobs, the kind of work that you would normally sort of perhaps outsource or would have taken like quite mm-hmm. a lot of time for you to do, whether that could be done by AI and the impact on, on firm resources as a result of that. Yeah, so I suppose they're sort of two major things. Um, how firms are reacting to the UPC as well, whether they're kind of pooling resources together, if they're suing mergers or kind of tie up agree- agreements. And um, we see some firms over in Europe kind of not a formal merger, but they've kind of got best friend arrangements, whatever you want to call it, with um, with other uh, European firms sort of tackle UPC work and whether there's any sort of competition concerns arising from that. Um, so these are the kind of interesting things to look at, I suppose, at the moment. That's interesting. Yeah, we, I mean, my firm, we've been looking a little bit at the future gazing yeah. and strategy, and we had the good think about AI, and we 
decided we'd take it very seriously. Clients mm. not that keen on using it, a lot of them. It was 50-50. But yeah, uh, it's uh, it's something that we I think we have to take really seriously. And you know, as, a, as an old bloke, I don't always do that. So I'm forcing myself to realize I just watch my kids. Um, yeah. I won't say I wouldn't they wouldn't dream of writing job applications using AI just in case their potential employees are listening but you know that kind of thing and it's uh, it's eye-opening what's going on and so even if my generation really? doesn't like yeah. the sound of it that doesn't really count what's your very early thoughts as a firm about how you're going to respond to it what's your kind of sort of short-term strategy I suppose sure so I think um, in terms of responding uh, yeah take it seriously it's not yeah. fit for purpose yet but it's evolving so rapidly that that is not mm. an argument um i think in terms of what it can do i think some of the kind of commoditizable aspects of the job will be done uh, i think everybody's worrying about what that means for training and how many trainees one has but i don't think it's going to replace the trainee role at all i think it's going to replace just roles that nobody wants to do that and also that clients aren't going to pay for for a while yet so i think what's going to happen is that the human quality amongst the patent attorney and amongst the support function will continue uh, and we'll just start, you know, streamlining where bits nobody wants to do is is the short term. Longer term, don't see them doing diff- the AI doing anything kind of really complex or being trust- trusted to for quite a while yet. Uh, and then in 10 years, I find it difficult to think that far ahead at the moment because things change so rapidly right now. But we're comfortable for five years of things staying, you know, comfortable but evolving. And we're going to have to keep an eye on that. And some clients are Five years. Yeah. <clears throat> five years in a job is is good enough for me. I'll take that. So we'll see what happens. We'll we'll see what happens in five happens. years when you can just get AI to write an article I'm, I'm, about IP law. All my predictions so far have been brilliant. I remember saying Google Maps would never take off, so that was a good one. So yeah, that's, that's gone well. Um, we, we're rolling um, towards the the end. Um, mm. Lee would always ask this. Lee, all our thoughts with you and your lot, by the way. Um, but um, Lee would always ask at this stage anything that we should have asked you that we should have let you comment on. Have we missed anything? No, not that I can think of. Um, there's lots of things that I can talk about that aren't IP related, but I'm guessing that's not massively of interest to you on this podcast. Well, it does bring me to, to Lee's dirty trick, which I'm going to repeat today, which is okay. if you listen to all, we, we normally have a question for each of us um, at the end. And it goes okay. like this. I come up with a question that I know I've already got an answer to because I know Lee's trick. Then I bounce it onto Neil with absolutely no notice, and he panics and comes up with something that gives you time to think, Max. And then I can just sit there and say what I was going to say anyway. So, Lee, we know what you do. I'm just repeating it. Thank you for. I'm learning from the master. Uh, and Max, you mentioned um, at the beginning that you know in your in your history you had a, a time at a local newspaper. I mm-hmm. can imagine that that was a, there were some interesting things happened there. But I, I've, as I've never worked in a local newspaper, the question is. So you've had some earlier jobs. Any any good stories? Any good story from earlier jobs that you had that you want to share? Neil, you're up. Um, I always found it quite funny to just consider the sheer mundanity of some of the stories that are covered by local newspapers, such as those that me and Max used to work at. And I once had a story about a pensioner that was left at a bus stop. So that was my most mundane story. As part, of a, found as part of a campaign to improve bus services, that was in Kent. What, what happened to the pensioner? Presumably, she was. She's not still there. It was. A, it was. It was an old guy, and he was just left at the bus stop. The bus went oh. past. That was it. Oh. End of story. Oh, we got the next bus. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's a big one. Okay, that yeah. is that is quite. Pensioner well, I mean, just... at bus stop. Yeah, headline. <laughs> Scandalous. Max, what have you got? So. I actually did one that was, I think, quite cool, but also quite sort of unbelievable that it hadn't actually been discovered before. So someone contacted me anonymously who worked for the NHS, one of the local hospitals, um, and she said that her boss or direct boss, the sort of borough, he was very senior, actually. He was like a sort of managing director of like three different hospital trusts. Um, and he was on one of these sort of temporary contracts sort of that they renew per month. So he was being paid massively more than you would be if you were on a sort of annual salary. Um, I think we worked out that he was paid something about £350,000 a year or something, which is obviously you know, NHS, you know, a lot of money. People get sensitive about that sort of stuff. Anyway, and she just contacted me and said, this guy's um, been convicted for armed robbery. And I was like, right, OK. So I did a quick Google search. And sure enough, you know, let out of prison four years ago for holding up a petrol station with a gun and armed robbery, didn't, and then decided to get a very high-paid job 
as an NHS director with seemingly no background checks done whatsoever. And um, yeah, so that was quite a uh, quite an interesting amazing. one, I thought. And then they put it to the hospital trust and they had to quickly sort of shunt him off and admit that yes. they used an agency and obviously didn't do any background checks whatsoever. Um, what's which is quite interesting. It? Yeah. yeah, it was. It got picked up by a lot of the nationals, particularly yeah. nationals with an axe to grind against the NHS. Yeah. Who are, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. which is, uh, yeah, that was quite oh, a good cool. one, I thought. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. An unusual skill set, I'd say. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Armed so robbery and managing oh. hospital trusts. Yeah. Not more interesting than my story. No, they're both good. I'm sure you can bring it together. So I always try and bring them together. I'm not going to try today. Um, so mine, I haven't, um, I'm, I have a partner turning man and boy, so I haven't really had that many jobs. But I did have a summer job once where I worked in a stationary company. And one of my jobs was to help them computerize their inventory. And I had to invent, I had to create a fake product uh, as an item on the, on the inventory. And I came up with the idea of the knobbly leather groin grip. Because I was a student and I liked it, and so I had this. It was on the inventory. What I I was quite get gullible as well, and they found it without telling me, and then got a client, a customer, to phone up and ask for a hundred, and I. I had to take the call. And because I was, I didn't realize it would wind up at any point, and they'd also, they'd also take me to the pub last day. You know, quite drunk, quite nervous and desperately trying to explain that we'd run out. I think I can't remember how I handled it, but it was uh, it was a good. You one. should take it to Dragon's Den. Anyway. Yes, <laughs> it's, I don't quite know where that came from in my head. I promise. Mm. Um, that has been really good, Max. Thanks, good, yeah. great to see you, Neil. Thank you so much for stepping thank in and you. doing a brilliant job as thanks, ever. Max. Lee, as I say, hope things all right. Um, uh, Max, I know you've got your own podcast. That's what we should finish on. Let's plug your podcast quickly. Yeah, so we we do the IP Lounge um, every month. We sort of just review what we've been writing about the previous month. So we're due to record our latest one in a couple of days, where we'll talk about everything that happened in January. Um, and occasionally we we open out and we have we have special guests on there before. So um, I'd like to you know turn the favour at some point and have um you know have you guys on as well at some point, which would be great. Oh, I'd love that. Thank you very much. That was exactly what we were angling for. That went really well. Thank you. No, <laughs> yeah. it's great to see you. Um, Neil, see you soon. And you. Thanks for having we'll me. Do. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye.